This video is the third piece of course content for week two of the course Quantitative Analysis, Applied Inferential Statistics. This video introduces tools for cleaning and tidying our data, as well as skills for making our code more readable. I want to talk about three things today. I want to quickly review the idea of tidy data and then spend the majority of this video discussing five basic verbs, or actions, for modifying our data. Finally, I want to talk about the idea of piping functions. To begin, I want to just quickly remind you of what we are trying to accomplish, or at least maintain, when we wrangle or clean our data. That end goal is tidy data. We discussed this during week one. Tidy data sets, like families, have similar characteristics. Each variable is stored in its own column, for example, named here F, M, and A, and each observation is stored in its own row. When we clean data, we want to make sure we either get our data into this format or keep our data in this format. Variables should represent one and only one concept, and a row should represent one and only one observation. As we go through this cleaning process, the main package we'll use is called dplyr. Like ggplot2, this is part of the tidyverse. It is designed specifically for data wrangling and is based around the idea of verbs. When we discuss data cleaning, we are really describing a set of actions that we carry out on our data. Today, I want to focus on five of them. The first action is renaming variables. This takes our simple data model from before on the left, the variables f, m, and a, and renames the a variable, Adam, which you can see on the right. To accomplish this, we use the verb rename. The rename function takes a couple of key arguments. We want to provide the data frame we are editing, and then, after a comma, specify the new variable name set equal to the old variable name. So, for example, we could edit the fuel efficiency data so that the variable for highway fuel efficiency, spelled HWY, is renamed to include the letters MPG. One cautionary note is that this is only one part of what we need to do. Not only do we need to instruct R to make the change, but we need to direct R to assign these changes to a data frame. This seems counterintuitive. Of course we want to make the changes permanent, so why add another step to make it happen? The thing to remember is that this gives us a ton of flexibility that we can really leverage. We can push changes in data to a second or third data frame while preserving the original data frame that will still be available to us in our environment. Or we can make temporary changes to support work like modeling or plotting. If you've done statistical work before, one of the biggest adjustments with R is the idea that we can have multiple data frames open at once. This is not an option with other packages. And while it makes things more complicated, it's really an opportunity for us to exploit. To make these assignment changes, we have two options. We can either assign changes to a new object, like in example one, or we can assign changes back to the same original object, like in example two. Again, this gives us a lot of flexibility that we can leverage. In both cases, we adjust the data frame that appears on the left side of the assignment operator. A second task we may wish to accomplish is reordering our observations. In our original data model on the left, the values of the variable f are not in any particular order. If we want to order them, as in the example on the right, from low to high, we can do that easily. We can also reorder our observations from high to low, as in this example. Regardless of the order, it will impact every variable for every observation, since the entire order of the data frame will change. We accomplish this effect with the verb arrange. We can specify one or more variables to sort our data on. In this example, we'll sort cars from low to high based on their highway fuel efficiency. If we wanted to sort them from high to low, we could wrap the variable for highway fuel efficiency in the descending function. D -E -S -C. The flexibility to specify a list of variables instead of just one means that we can sort our data based on one characteristic, like type of car, and then specify the sort order within each car type as well, by a second or even third factor. The practical implication of this is that we are changing the underlying order of our data. Here I've loaded the MPG data into a data frame named AutoData. I can use the head function to look at the first six observations. We see that the data appear to be sorted based on the manufacturer. All the initial cars are Audi vehicles. A deeper exploration using the view command with a capital V confirms this. 
We can also look at the last few observations using the tail function. Here again, we see indications of data that have been alphabetized, with the last six observations all being Volkswagen cars. Now we can change the order by arranging the data based on highway fuel efficiency. After assigning that change back onto the auto data frame, we now see that the first few observations all have very low highway fuel efficiency, just 12 miles per gallon for the Dodge and Jeep models. If we want to put the most fuel efficient vehicles first, we can do that using the descending function, spelled D-E-S-C. Now, the Volkswagen and Japanese cars with exceptionally high gas mileage are the first observations. Sometimes we only want to look at some of our observations. Perhaps in the variable m on the left-hand data frame, there are a and b values, and we are only really interested in the b values at the moment. We can easily subset our data to isolate these observations, as in the data frame on the right. The verb for this action is filter. When we filter our data, we isolate particular observations that meet one or more characteristics defined by an expression. These expressions all must evaluate as either true or false. They use a set of logical and relational operators that allow us to combine multiple arguments and evaluate relationships like greater than or less than or equal to. Our commands sheet for this lecture includes all of the relational and logical operators you might need for this semester. In this example, we have a simple expression that filters observations where the highway fuel efficiency is greater than or equal to 30 miles per gallon. We only keep the observations that are true based on the outcome of this expression. This reliance on true or false is called Boolean logic. It is named for George Boole, an English mathematician pictured here who, during a tragically short career, established the field of Boolean algebra premised on the idea that logical relations could be used to evaluate algebraic expressions as being either true or false. This logic is fundamental in modern computing and modern computer programming. When we instruct R to filter based on a particular expression, in this case highway fuel efficiency, we are really asking the computer to look at each observation and compare it to the given value, in this case 30. For each observation, the computer compares the given value to the observed value and decides if the expression is true or false. I've added the evaluation results in blue to an example data frame. Since the Audi A4's miles per gallon is 29, the expression evaluates as false. Same for my Subaru Forester, whose 23 miles per gallon also evaluate as false since they are under 30. Only the Toyota Corolla is filtered into the new data frame because the evaluation for its 35 miles per gallon is greater than or equal to 30, and therefore evaluates as true. This is the fundamental logic behind both the filter function and any expression that we evaluate in R. We can also subset based on strings. Here we filter out observations that are manufactured by Subaru. Note that this is case sensitive, so we must spell Subaru with a lowercase s since that is how it appears in the data frame. There are more complicated ways to search within strings, but we're going to keep it simple for now. And here's an example of what this simple search looks like. We run the structure function on our subset of data, and we see now that there are only 14 observations, all Subarus. We can subset our data another way, based on selecting particular variables we want to retain and discarding variables we are not interested in. This change to our data is premised on the verb select. We can select variables we want to keep, as we do here with a number of variables in the MPG data frame. This example would give us a data frame with all the observations still intact, but with the data only for the four variables we listed, as shown here. Alternatively, we could select the variables that we want to remove by including a negation symbol, the dash, in front of each variable. This removes only the listed variables. This twist on the select function leaves us with all of our observations and the seven variables that we did not specify in the function. The final data cleaning task we are often faced with is creating new variables that help us produce more narrow, specific analyses. We often need to add variables to our existing data set by altering existing data, as we see here with an original data frame on the left that has an additional variable added to it on the right. One reason for doing this might be to create new calculated numeric variables out of an existing one. Perhaps we want to know a car's average miles per gallon. We can average the highway and city values to obtain this. 
These calculations rely on the four mathematical operations given on your command sheet for this lecture. Here we add city and highway miles per gallon together and then divide the sum by two, a nice preview of week three for the class. We can also create binary measures easily using the mutate function combined with the if else function. We create a new variable and provide an expression as well as predetermined values if the expression is true and if it is false. For example, we could create a binary measure to evaluate whether cars have high fuel efficiency. If they have a miles per gallon value of at least 30, the new logical variable is set to true. If the car does not, the new logical variable is set to false. We can do the same with character data. For example, we can create a logical variable that indicates whether a car is made by Subaru or not. There is not output associated with successful implementations of the mutate function. It's a good idea to check the results using the table function, which gives us a simple frequency for each category present in our variable. Note that the table function uses a dollar sign, and recall that multiple data frames are possible in R. To retrieve data from a specific variable, it is often necessary to include references to both the data frame and the variable. We separate the two objects with a dollar sign. To this point, we have treated these actions as if they occur in isolation. However, data cleaning and data analysis often take place as part of a large number of functions implemented together. In that context, the constant assignment of data can get cumbersome very quickly. Here's an example that combines a number of functions to produce a new data frame representing only Japanese automobiles. You can see how the constant specification of data frames makes that code hard to read, and typing that code can get old really quickly. Enter Donald Knuth, the originator of the typesetting system that became LaTeX. One idea he espoused was that we write code for computers, but that this has consequences. It often means that humans can struggle to read the code. In a context where reproducibility is critical and code is a key piece of that reproducibility, code that is difficult to read is a real hindrance. Instead, Nuth challenges us to write code that explains to humans what we want the computer to do. The tidyverse gives us tools that allow us to accomplish this task easily. The pipe operator, highlighted here in orange on the left, makes our code far easier to read and write. While it is part of the MagRitter package, the pipe operator is built into dplyr as well, with MagRitter being automatically loaded when you load dplyr individually or as a part of the tidyverse. Now, compare the code I showed you previously on the left with new code on the right that is piped. They both accomplish the same task, but the code on the right uses far fewer characters and is easier to read, which means it is easier to debug and easier to replicate. Pipes can also be read like lists. For example, we can read through this list of actions where we, one, take the MPG data frame, then two, select the manufacturer, model, and fuel efficiency variables, then three, rename the city gas mileage variable, then four, rename the highway gas mileage variable, then five, filter observations for Japanese automobile manufacturers, then six, create a new average miles per gallon variable, then seven, arrange observations from high to low based on the new fuel efficiency variable, then eight, and finally, assign these changes to a new data frame called Japanese autos. Every time we say the word then, we insert a pipe operator. Note that the assignment occurs in the opposite way with a right facing arrow. I prefer this method over assigning data as we do here, where the assignment occurs first. Assigning the data last makes the code read in a more linear fashion. Also note that we make no reference to the source data frame after the initial call, step one, where we make reference to MPG. Tidyverse functions are pipeable in the sense that if they are included in a chain of functions, they do not need the data reference after that first time. This is not true for all functions, so beware of base R functions that may throw errors when the data frame is omitted in a pipe set of functions. Also note that pipes should always be short. We don't want to see chains of functions that are 30 and 40 lines long. Finally, I want to highlight that ggplot2 functions can be built into pipes as well. If you only need to make changes that are temporary to produce a particular 
plot. It isn't even necessary to assign those changes to a data frame. Simply allow them to remain temporary with the final plot, the only saved manifestation of your piped functions changes.